Good afternoon. We hope you're safe, healthy, and taking care of yourselves and your loved ones. I am John Gittleman, Dean of the Yodem School of Ecology at the University of Georgia. COVID-19 is confronting virtually every facet of our lives with an unprecedented challenge, and we must mount collectively a sustained, ambitious response that will protect the health and the welfare of all of us. Today, on the 7th of May, 2020, despite 3.76 million confirmed cases worldwide of COVID, and in the US, 1.26 million cases, and another 74,000 people that have died, we still know very little about this virus. How does COVID spread? What's the precise level of contact distance from one person to another? Where did COVID come from? What affects immunity levels of people contracting the virus? Is it mutating from one population to another? All we really know is that we need to double down on the science, the facts, develop approaches that are effective in the long run and realize that we have only experienced this awful virus for a short blip of time. It's only been a few months since the first case was diagnosed in the US, and we do not know a single person that has survived beyond six months. It's essential that we believe in science technology, invest in long-term solutions, and develop predictive approaches to the where, when, and how to manage and protect from COVID. The Center for the Ecology of Infectious Disease at the University of Georgia has fortunately been studying just these problems for some time and is now on the front lines for developing specific predictions about the behavior of COVID-19. Today, you'll hear about the work from Dr. John Drake, director of the center. Specifically, Dr. Drake will describe what is involved in so-called models. How are they developed? What's the essence of some of the data? And what are, as we very often hear, the sensitivity and the effects of the assumptions behind the models? Dr. Drake will clearly describe this work and then we'll open up on the webinar for questions. So please be thinking about questions to ask at the end. Again, thank you all for being here. We're all in this together. Dr. Drake. Thank you, John. And I'd like to begin by thanking all of you for taking the time to learn more about our uh, coronavirus working group and how we're addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as, uh, as was said, today I'm going to give you an in overview of our work and to share some ways that you can get involved. Uh, and I'm planning to leave plenty of time for discussion. Uh, so I look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions as well. The University of Georgia has long been a leader in infectious disease research. And what sets us apart is, in my view, the diversity of fields that are represented. Rather than taking a purely medical approach, the university has researchers in public health, the College of Veterinary Medicine, ecology, and many other fields working to predict and better control disease outbreaks. This multidisciplinary approach is important because three out of every four new or emerging diseases uh, arise in, uh, from animals. COVID-19, for instance, is thought to have emerged from bats. As you can see from this slide, the Center for the Ecology of Infectious Diseases was only founded in 2016. We believe we are the global leader in the field of disease ecology through the research we conduct and through training promising students and postdoctoral researchers who are themselves going on to become leaders in the field at other institutions. Our goal is to strengthen this position, to build on this strength, and to transform the understanding of infectious diseases through a more holistic perspective that emphasizes the environmental and sometimes multi-species context in which infectious diseases are transmitted. We value a diversity of thought and expertise. In addition to faculty from 15 departments, schools, and colleges on campus, the center also includes members from universities like Emory and the University of Toronto, as well as government agencies like the CDC. We've been very successful in winning large grants from federal agencies like the National Science Foundation. Private support is vitally important in supporting graduate and postdoctoral researchers, as well as in helping us attract and retain top faculty. Private support also provides seed funding for new projects. We can then leverage the preliminary data from those studies to attract larger federal grants. 
The Odom School of Ecology is named for Eugene Odom, who's often called the father of modern ecology. The holistic approach that he championed for understanding how ecosystems work applies to the transmission and control of diseases as well. Ecologists have been creating models to describe ecosystems for decades. We have historically examined relationships like predator-prey interactions and shifts in species composition following the introduction of an invasive species or of new diseases. In this case, the new disease happens to be COVID-19. The fact that we take a holistic, multidisciplinary approach to infectious disease research gives us a substantial edge. The CEID Working Group was formed on January 24th, 2020, three days after the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention activated its emergency response system in reaction to the outbreak of a novel coronavirus, what we call SARS coronavirus 2, in the city of Wuhan, China. Our group includes more than 30 researchers with data science expertise in data analysis and interpretation, visualization, geographic information systems, machine learning, computational statistics, and especially dynamical modeling. The most public facing project that we have is what we call the COVID-19 portal, uh, which is our website, 2019-coronavirus-tracker.com. <clears throat> this portal is what we're using to disseminate data, models, and other findings. One of the tools on the portal is an interactive dashboard that we created for tracking the COVID-19 epidemic. I personally use this tool to maintain my own general awareness of the state of the epidemic. And I know that others in universities, health authorities, and government agencies around the country do too. I know this because they've told me. Uh, I wanted to take just a minute. I thought you might find it interesting if I demonstrate a little bit. So I'm gonna get out of the presentation and go to the web. You can do this uh, at home as well. And here's our website. Um, on the website, we present a bunch of, uh, of different uh, pieces of information, but what I'm gonna focus on right now is what we call the tracker. The tracker is basically uh, a dashboard for looking at the data as we collect it from around the world uh, every night, every day, the information on this website is different. To start, I'm gonna look at uh, the world, what's going on in the world. By selecting this world tab, I can compare the number of cases uh, in different countries and look at how that's changed over time. Uh, what I'm looking at right now, I can compare Italy, Spain, and the US. If I go over here, I can easily select another country, say Afghanistan to add to the plot, or Argentina, and compare among different countries. Taking a slightly more domestic focus, I can go back to the tab for US. Here we can compare among different US states. Uh, by default, we're looking at California, Georgia, and Washington, although we could actually look at any state or territory as well as the District of Columbia. So the plots that I'm showing here show the daily number of reported cases in each of these states, uh, the number of tests that are reported, and also the fraction of tests reported every day to be positive. Of course, instead of total Cases, I might be interested in total deaths, so I'll click on outcome and change that over to deaths. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, and we can visualize that uh, instead. The daily case count or the death count, of course, jumps around a lot. You can see that here. And that's for a lot of reasons. Sometimes it's helpful to visualize how the total number of cases or deaths rather than the daily number has changed over time. So we can look at that too. We get to the end of the epidemic, uh, and uh, to get to the end of the epidemic, uh, these different curves shown here for California, for Georgia, or for Washington uh, have to level off. What we see from this figure is that of these three states, Washington is the one that's closest to achieving containment. It's the one that's closest to leveling off. Uh, Georgia's next um, with an epidemic that's growing a bit faster than Washington but slower than, for instance, the state of California. Of course, of these three states, then California has the biggest epidemic. Um, it's possible that this is just because California is the biggest state of the three. So from an epidemiological point of view, 
it might be more informative if we look at the number of deaths as a fraction of the total population. So we have a tool for doing that too. If I scroll down here, instead of the uh, absolute number, I'd like to know the number per 100,000 persons. Toggling the plot to look at the number of deaths per 100,000 residents, we see that actually from this point of view, Georgia has the largest epidemic with currently 12 out of every 100,000 people in the state having already died. And of course that number uh, continuing to arise. Uh, obviously these data are crucial. Pausing for a moment for the internet connection. Obviously, these data are crucial to understanding this current state of the epidemic. But for various reasons, which I think are well known now, the data don't tell the whole story. So we have to use models to help interpret these data. And because models are so central to what we do, I thought I might briefly explain what epidemic models are. From my point of view, models are basically a tool. They're a tool that helps us to reason clearly and transparently. You might say, well, what are the alternatives to models? Expert opinion is one alternative, but expert opinions aren't transparent. Experts sometimes themselves may not even know why they think certain things. And anyway, anything that can be learned from expert opinion can always be measured and then incorporated in a model. So models are everything that expert opinion provides plus, plus others as well. So raw data, like we were just looking at, that's another alternative to models. But you can't have raw data about things you haven't observed. And so that would include, for instance, the total number of infections, which we know is far larger than the number of cases, or things that will happen in the future. Models are very useful for reasoning about unobservables. Models can aid decision making by allowing us to ask questions and test assumptions about things we can't measure directly. For instance, how interventions like social distancing can change the course of an epidemic. And of course, some models are better than others, and all of them rely on various assumptions. In the case of the coronavirus pandemic, a number of variables ranging from the rate of transmission to the fatality rate are quite poorly understood. Models allow us to understand this, uh, this lack of understanding. Models are never perfect representations of nature, but they are a valuable tool. Unlike gut instincts and conjectures, they can be tested through the scientific process and they can be refined. When models are informed by data analysis, there's an automatic procedure for correction and improvement. In the case of any disease outbreak, and in particular COVID-19, there are a large number of unknowns. Modelers make good faith assumptions based on their expertise and judgment, but the assumptions that go into creating models undoubtedly influence the results. Good modelers are very self-critical about their assumptions and seek to assess the robustness of their results to alternative assumptions. So as for the last question here, are your models any good? I will say we have a good record of success as measured by publications in peer reviewed journals and experience with previous outbreaks. The picture shown here illustrates just one of our models, a kind of model called a compartmental model. And I'll return to that in a few minutes. All of our models build upon the lessons we've learned from past outbreaks, from Ebola in Africa to West Nile virus in New York City and, uh, and even animal pathogens like white nose syndrome, which is an emerging pathogen that's affecting bats across North America. In the current pandemic, we've shared our expertise with states and governments uh, and with the CDC. Our role, however, is not to make recommendations about policy, but to provide information that helps leaders make decisions that are informed by the very best data and science. We have made several strides, we believe, in understanding this pandemic. We've modeled the global importation risk based on uh, airline flight volume and patterns to provide insight into how trade and tourism have shaped COVID-19 transmission. Uh, we actually believe this model could be of tremendous value as at some point we will be seeking to reopen international travel again. We've also developed a nowcast. Uh, this is a model that estimates the size of the hidden epidemic, i.e. all the cases that go unreported, either because they're very mild or because of limited testing capacity or because for some other reason they're missed by the health system. This is critically important in the case of COVID-19 
since variations in case reporting among and even within states have made understanding the true burden of the epidemic extremely difficult. And here's another model. Here's where I return to that compartmental model that I mentioned earlier. For Georgia, we've conducted a scenario analysis. Using data derived from cell phones, we found that social distancing measures in the state have likely saved more than 2,900 lives already. The study also found that relaxing vigilance could result in as many as 38,000 additional cases and 1,500 additional deaths through June 7th, cumulatively. Scenario analyses like these can only be done with good models. Scenario analyses allow us to test ideas about how to contain an outbreak and give policymakers data that helps inform decision making by asking what could happen, what might, what might happen. The models put numbers behind some of the most fundamental questions surrounding the outbreak. Things like how bad could this get and how can we make it better? We're currently in the process of developing scenario analyses for other states as well. This model considers four social distancing scenarios. Increasing social distancing, maintaining the status quo, relaxing social distancing, or a return to complete normal activity. Uh, these are shown here in this figure. I'll be back in just one moment. Sorry about that. I think the internet is being tested today. So the dotted vertical line in this figure uh, is today. And the solid red line here, this solid red line shows the uh, amount of uh, human movement in the state of Georgia as a percentage of what we would consider to be normal. Uh, we start uh, our four main scenarios from today and we consider what might happen going forward. So where, uh, uh, where movement goes back up to normal, relaxing social distancing, maintaining social distancing where we are now, or decreasing our human movement uh, so that we're increasing distancing. A model for Georgia clearly indicates that social distancing has had a positive effect on controlling the spread of COVID-19. If social distancing had not occurred, the number of COVID-19 reported cases in Georgia might be over 300,000 today uh, and just under 3 million by June 16th. Uh, our model also predicts that returning to normal activity now could result in four times as many cases by June 16th if we maintained our current level. Relaxing distancing to 80% of normal would double the number of cases and increasing distancing uh, would cut them uh, perhaps by as much as half. <clears throat> so in conclusion, we have learned a lot, but there are still plenty of questions that we're trying to answer through our research. I think I'll start with some of the lessons learned. So first, early intervention is critical and social distancing saves lives. I firmly believe that we've slowed the rate of growth in infections, what's commonly known as bending the curve, uh, but that we're also nowhere close to the end of the pandemic. Our active research questions include identifying the most effective response strategies, strategies that can work in Georgia, around the country and worldwide, uh, and providing information to help policymakers better manage any future waves of COVID-19 as well as any other infectious diseases that might emerge. We're also exploring how we can relax social distancing safely. I understand that the massive economic devastation that lockdown causes, but also I believe that this, uh, these economic costs pale in comparison to the cost of a controlled outbreak, uh, an uncontrolled outbreak. After social distancing is safely relaxed, the next question we'll consider is how to resume trade and travel. Scientists, I believe, are rightly concerned about the possibility of a second wave of infections in the fall and winter, and we're working to identify measures that could prevent, or at the very least, minimize a second wave. And finally, 
I mentioned earlier that our current models build upon work that we've done with Ebola uh, back in 2014. The knowledge that we gain, I believe, in fighting this outbreak can be used to fight future pandemics as well. So we're working to identify the most effective response strategies <clears throat> uh, to reduce uh, future waves of COVID-19 uh, and to anticipate any major future outbreaks. COVID-19 pandemic is actually the third major outbreak caused by a coronavirus in the past 18 years. An outbreak of SARS occurred in 2002 in Asia and Toronto, and that was followed by an outbreak of MERS in the Middle East in 2012. This is to me a very troubling trend, and I believe the investments we make today in research can save lives and minis minimize disruption during this pandemic, of course, but also in the future, whether it's caused by a coronavirus, flu, or some other pathogen. How can you help? There are several ways that you can help to support the Center for the Ecology of Infectious Diseases and its coronavirus working group. First of all, please spread the word about the work that we're doing. Share our website. We have 30 faculty, staff, postdocs, and students who are applying their expertise with one goal in mind, and that's to save as many lives as possible. Fellowships for students help uh, support the work of graduate students, postdoctoral researchers, and these are the men and women who are poised to become leaders in the field of disease ecology. It is absolutely crucial that we build this national expertise. I can tell you that in many cases, a fellowship is what makes the difference between whether a student pursues a career in the sciences or doesn't. Endowed chairs can help attract and retain top faculty. Eugene Odom's vision of holistic science is alive here at UGA, and we're at our best when we can bounce ideas and collaborate with each other. Providing seed grant funding for pilot studies is another way that you can support research. The data from those preliminary studies makes it much more likely that applications for large federal grants will get funded. And finally, I hope that you'll stay in touch. Visit our COVID-19 portal. Feel free to reach out to me or to Allison Walters, our development and alumni relations coordinator. I've given you a lot of information today, but I think we have plenty of time left over for questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Drake. I really do want to um, uh, thank all of you for attending uh, the lecture today. And uh, if you'd hit your Q&A button and send questions in, Dr. Drake is happy to entertain those and respond to ideas that you may have about the models that he presented. Um, if you wouldn't elaborate a little bit, Dr. Drake, on if there are folks that would like to support the research that you're doing, are there specific areas that they could support that would help um, the success, some of the solutions that you're working toward? Uh, certainly there are. Um, you know, as I said, we've got 30 people, uh, many working uh, many long hours. Uh, and frankly, our bandwidth right now is the rate limiting step, the ability to mobilize people and work on these projects. Uh, I think that the models that I presented today uh, show a lot of promise uh, and they provide a lot of useful information. Uh, but there's a couple of key things that we don't know yet um, that we're actually very eager to, uh, um, to work on. So the first is we know that there have been a lot of what we call non-pharmaceutical interventions deployed. So these include the shelter in place orders and the business closures, uh, but also things like infection barriers in healthcare facilities, uh, uh, in, uh, in places of commerce, like the um, infection screens that you see at the grocery store, uh, wearing of face masks. Uh, we don't yet have a good quantitative handle on how effective all of these different non-pharmaceutical interventions are. We know that in aggregate, they've been super effective uh, because we've been able to reduce the, the transmission of, of COVID-19. Uh, but going forward, I think we want to have um, a much uh, nimbler approach to applying interventions. And that's gonna mean we need to measure how these uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions have had their effects. We've been collecting data on that uh, but we have not uh, yet had the, the bandwidth to analyze all of those data. And I believe that the sooner we can analyze those data, the sooner that information can be, uh, can be effectively used. The other thing that we're doing is I showed you a scenario analysis for the state of Georgia. And this is based on a, a model which is calibrated specifically to our population, its size, its behavior. Uh, I believe that we can 
um, scale this up to cover all 50 states as well as, uh, as US territories. Uh, but that's gonna take additional work. And so that's one of our, our major projects going forward that we'd really like to, to invest in. Really interesting question that come in is with regard to other models. We all see on the news and hear reports that there's a model that supports this and a model that supports that. How does someone perceive and assess the, um, the accuracy and the rigor of a model? Are there certain publications that you would follow more than others? Well, I can, I can answer that question in two ways. So first I can answer it, well, how is it the scientists assess it? And the answer is by predictive performance. Uh, and so we measure predictive performance either by uh, withholding some data from our model and then uh, using our model to predict that data when we have a known outcome. Uh, and the other is by uh, forecasting future events, being totally honest and transparent about what our predictions are. And then um, when the time passes, measure what happened and see which models agreed. Uh, we're actually participating in a forecasting challenge that's run out of the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, about 20 experts around the country are regularly submitting predictions to that group uh, and they are collating those and reporting back on a weekly basis of how well those various models perform. It also gives you a good way to gauge what the range of opinion across the country is. Uh, in terms of um, uh, publications, uh, yes, uh, I can understand how confusing it is. It's confusing for me as a scientist at this time. Uh, I think that our traditional medical sources are probably the most reliable. Uh, myself, I look very closely to, um, uh, to scientific journals and medical journals uh, for what they report. Um, but the other thing is that, uh, you know, we have a strong community of scientists in this country uh, that has been working together for about 15 years. Uh, there's a group of modelers called the Midas Coordination Network. Uh, and, um, and one of the ways that I gauge the, um, the quality of work is by asking whether or not these scientists have produced high quality work in the past. Uh, and I think that's a, a strong way to evaluate the credibility of, uh, of some of what you're reading. Is there a way that folks could follow up and learn a little bit more about Midas? Absolutely. Uh, I think we will follow this, uh, this webinar with maybe some kind of email communication and we can include in that a link to the Midas network, uh, as well as I think there's a, a link on our uh, COVID-19 portal website as well. So there's an interesting question following up on uh, models. And there's a quote from uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, the models are only as good as the data that are put into them. How do you go about assuring that the data you use are good data? Well, we use the very best data that we can. One of the things is that we look for internal consistency. So we'd like to know that, uh, that data that comes from different places uh, seems to uh, result in the, uh, the same uh, kind of answer. Uh, another thing is that we look at the, um, uh, we ask the question, how sensitive are our model results uh, to the input of one variable or another? Uh, and if we find that, um, that a particular, uh, that a model is insensitive to a particular variable, then that tells us knowing that, that variable very precisely isn't very important. On the other hand, if there are variables, and one of them is, for instance, the transmissibility, uh, the contagiousness, if there's variables like this um, to which models are super sensitive, then those are the things that we need to concentrate all of our, our information on estimating. Uh, another thing that we do is we develop probabilistic models uh, that represent basically what the data would look like if the world behaves in one way versus in another way. If the epidemic uh, is, is occurring according to one set of rules versus another set of rules for transmission. And by comparing those, um, those probabilistic models to the data that we actually observe, there's a very rigorous set of statistical methods uh, called the theory of maximum likelihood that allows us to quantify the confidence that we have in the conclusions that we draw. Thank you all for sending these questions and they're really excellent. Here's one uh, related to estimating uh, the death rate. So there's an estimated observed death rate of 0.9%. 
Uh, how do you go about estimating the final death rate? Does the death rate estimate the effects uh, in your now graphs, uh, the shape of these? Uh, how do you go about considering different scales of the death rate in your models? That's a great question. So estimating the, uh, the fatality rate during an epidemic is actually one of the hardest problems because of course, what you're interested in is a quantity that's only gonna be known precisely, if at all, at the very end. Uh, with respect to COVID-19 in particular, there are uh, two different death rates to keep in mind. One is what we call the case fatality rate, uh, which is of those, um, those people who have become infected that are known to the system, uh, they've become cases, how many of those die? And the other is the infection fatality rate. And so one of the features of COVID-19 uh, is that for many people who are infected, they only experience uh, very mild symptoms or maybe even no symptoms at all. Uh, and so as a result, they are never counted. Um, so on the one hand, that's a benefit because uh, it means that um, uh, that the extent of severe disease is actually far less than it might have been. On the other hand, that makes the epidemic itself extremely difficult to observe because of the massive uh, extent of undercounting. So the 0.9% uh, death rate uh, that uh, was quoted uh, is an infection fatality rate. So it's based on an estimate of the total number of people that have been infected. And this came out of early studies that were conducted in, uh, in the province of Hubei and the city of Wuhan in China. The way that one estimates an infection fatality rate is you need to record all of the uh, uh, fatal cases that you know about. And then after the epidemic is over, you can divide through by the total number of cases, if you can, or the total number of infections, if you can estimate that total number of infections. And the way customarily that that is done is by um, conducting what's called an uh, 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 sero, uh, sero positivity survey or sero conversion survey. An antibody test is used after the fact to try and measure what fraction of the population became infected. Actually, the 0.9% uh, statistic itself wasn't measured in exactly that way. We also know that um, there are different uh, uh, risk factors for, uh, for having a fatal case. And so the, uh, the, that number has been adjusted to account for the demography of the United States in comparison to um, the demography of China. Now you asked how that relates to our now casting estimate. In fact, we think, we especially thought at the very beginning of the epidemic that that 0.9% or approximately 1% infection fatality rate is probably one of the most precisely known things about the epidemic. Uh, because that's something that's not likely to change greatly from place to place. Um, and, uh, and because there had already been uh, a substantial uh, uh, transmission within China for us to estimate this from. So our now casting algorithm actually relies on that information to try and reconstruct uh, the, um, the number of infections that probably occurred uh, over time uh, in different places in the United States, in different US states and in the country as a whole. We then take that information and compare it with the total number of cases that are reported to estimate what the, um, what the number of unreported infections is probably uh, likely to be. Uh, and, uh, and that fraction of infections that gets reported is a statistic that we report on our website, which is known to epidemiologists as the ascertainment rate. So you're right to guess that all of these things are, um, uh, are intertwined. Uh, and what this shows really is the way in which we try and reason from the things that we think are most reliable or most observable uh, to things that we'd like to know, but are very difficult to estimate or observe. So this is a follow-up on the testing. And we've talked a lot about the number of cases, uh, cases that are confirmed. Do the models take into account the availability of the tests? Uh, <clears throat> models can take into account the availability of tests. Um, in fact, our models currently are not doing so. Uh, and the reason is because we haven't been able to um, 
ascertain exactly what the test criteria are in a way that we can systematically apply across the state. So of course, as you have more tests, you expect to find more of the cases that were always there, you just didn't know about. And if you uh, apply tests in a consistent way, uh, whether that is by applying it to everybody that shows the same symptoms or by randomly sampling the population and applying it to people chosen at random, uh, in these cases, uh, it's possible to uh, um, estimate what the actual size of the, uh, of the epidemic is just based on uh, the positivity rate, the fraction of tests that come back positive. But, in, but that's not the way that we've been doing it. Uh, and that's for a very good reason. Uh, we would do it very differently if the use of tests was just as a measuring device, a barometer for uh, uh, the um, extent of the epidemic uh, in the state. In fact, tests are used much more importantly to um, determine clinical care decisions. So to decide what kind of treatment a person needs to receive uh, to determine that healthcare workers are kept safe. Uh, and it's not really possible to use testing both as a very precise barometer of the size of the epidemic and in order to um, uh, guide these operational decisions. We've been hearing a lot lately about population differences uh, in relation to race and age and gender, are the models taking into account more and more these population characteristics and will they help uh, make better predictions? So the models that we're currently publishing on our website uh, do not account for age differences, race differences, uh, or uh, geographic differences or uh, uh, healthcare vulnerability. Um, I do agree that those are actually really important, both to understanding uh, transmission, as well as to understanding uh, uh, hazards for severe disease or death. That's something that we've begun to work on from a biostatistical point of view, just to try and understand what those patterns are. And undoubtedly, as we understand it better, those differences uh, between people, those demographic variations that we call heterogeneity, this heterogeneity will result in improved models. So early on uh, in COVID, there was a definition about social distancing. And the CDC, they advocated uh, a six feet sort of measure or metric of social distance. Has anyone played around with that? What if social distancing were nine feet or eight feet? Does that do anything in terms of the spread uh, and the patterns of mitigation? So almost certainly that distance does matter. Um, probably if you increase from six feet to nine feet or 12 feet, uh, the contagiousness of an infectious case would go down. Uh, unfortunately, that's the kind of thing that we have the least amount of information about. So we understand very well, for instance, the clinical course of disease, the pathology of the disease. We also understand reasonably well what the, uh, what the transmission is like at a population level. We have roughly 10 million people in Georgia and we can represent transmission among these 10 million people in, in, a, way, in a way that I think gives us a, a pretty reliable prediction uh, for the state or maybe even at the county level. When you get to something smaller, like uh, say the transmission within a household or within a workplace, and it particularly the transmission probability for a particular event, right? A particular encounter between two people. That's where we have much less information. And you can see why that is, that those are very difficult to observe. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, nice, well-designed experiments, or we don't have highly detailed data on transmission events. Uh, it's only very rarely that we can actually identify that a particular occasion was when the infection passed from one person to another. That only happens very early in, in epidemics where relatively few people are infected and among very rare contacts so that you can be confident that the transmission that happened from person A to person B only happened in a, in a, uh, a very uh, well-defined context. There's been a lot of discussion lately about the importance of testing. 
And do you think that it would increase our knowledge of the virus and how well we model if there were more extensive testing, irrespective of the symptoms that are shown in cases? Yes, I think that more extensive testing, both diagnostic testing and antibody tests, will actually be essential to containing COVID-19. Uh, I think that they are important for us to be able to develop scientific information about transmission, where it's occurring, who, who it's affecting, where the hotspots are. Um, and I think it's also important for us to understand uh, the level of immunity in the population. I don't think we have a good estimate of, uh, of that level of immunity right now, uh, but I also think that we, uh, we have to understand that in order to, um, to safely return to uh, sort of life as normal. This is an environmental or ecological question. Uh, do you think warmer weather as we head into the summer is going to have any uh, effect on the spread of the virus? I do think that. Um, I, this is another one of those things that I think we can be reasonably confident in qualitatively, but the thing that's hard to say is quantitatively, how much does it matter? So um, the reason is because, so the, the reason that warmer weather has an effect uh, is because of its impact both on the stability of the virus and on the human immune response. And so uh, warmer, uh, more humid weather is not good for the virus and is good for the human uh, immune response. Uh, they've done experiments where they've taken virus and uh, put it on different surfaces and then tested it in cell culture to see after two hours, four hours, eight hours, 16 hours, how much of the virus was still viable. And from that, we know that environmental conditions like temperature humidity, and also the material of the surface that, that's being contaminated uh, matter to the, uh, the viability of the virus. Now, whether that matters for transmission depends on whether the majority of the transmission is through contaminated surfaces, things like doorknobs, or through direct exposure like you know, airborne droplets. Uh, I don't think that we have a very good answer to that question right now. But there is a model out of Oxford University, which I think credibly says that, uh, you know, a substantial portion of the uh, uh, of transmission is through environmental contamination. And if that's true, uh, then uh, then we should expect that uh, weather changes will have an impact. Uh, one of the things we'd like to do is measure the magnitude of that impact. Uh, but as you can guess, that's uh, only going to be done very indirectly. So it will continue to be one of those things that we are uh, quite unconfident about. And of course, there's counter examples as well. Uh, it's not as if um, all of the uh, humid, warm places in the world uh, just don't have any, uh, any COVID-19. That's not true, they do. Um, but uh, of course, that fact is confounded with other things like population size or access to health resources and federal policies or, or national policies that have been put into place. My biggest worry about the environmental effect is that it is going to be large. And as a result, we might get lulled into a sense of complacency by the late summer and early fall. And that uh, because of that complacency, when the COVID comes back in the late fall, uh, it, will be, uh, uh, it will come roaring back and in a way that we're not prepared for. It seems that every week there's an additional list of clinical medical uh, characteristics associated with COVID. Cough, fever, shortness of breath, loss of smell and taste. So as these are added, can they be used as sort of early warning signs of future COVID outbreaks? I think they could be used as early warning signs if we had a way to measure them in the population. Uh, so you're right, as our, uh, understanding of the clinical course of disease improves, uh, we're getting a much better picture of both the range of conditions that people can face and their frequency in the population. However, in order to leverage that information for something like a hotspot uh, detection or an early warning system, we would have to collect that information systematically across the population. That would require a lot of voluntary buy-in uh, among the population. I think it's a good thing to try. Uh, I think it's an interesting idea. And I also think that our best way of anticipating future outbreaks will be 
by leveraging multiple data streams, of which that might be just one. Here's a vaccine related question. Has anyone done an analysis where they look at differences in the rate of COVID in groups of folks that were vaccinated with flu vaccine and those that were not? I think there are studies like that that are ongoing, but I don't know uh, the outcomes of any of those studies. Okay. And here's a local question. Um, that the Athens fatality rate has been relatively flat uh, for a while. Is that indicative in any way of uh, how well we've been doing social distancing and uh, folks staying at home in the Athens area? So I should uh, preface my response by saying that I have not um, studied closely the county by county differences within the state of Georgia. I've mostly focused on trying to, to develop uh, predictions for the state as a whole. Uh, but I've also noticed the same thing. And, uh, and my impression is that um, this probably does have to do with the extent of social distancing. Mm -hmm. One of the data streams that I use to measure social distancing is from a company called Unicast. Uh, Unicast collects data from cell phones, um, particularly location-based services. So if you have a cell phone app that is uh, providing your location uh, to the company that, uh, that runs the app, uh, Unicast might have information on uh, where your cell phone is at different points in time. So based on this, uh, Unicast has developed a model, which is basically how much people are moving around, how much they're going back and forth to work. Uh, the data are not individual, they're completely anonymized and reported um, to us at the level of the county. But if I look at uh, a map of the state of Georgia, I see that the amount of, of mobility, the amount that people are actually moving around in Clark County um, seems to be less than in a lot of other places in the state. And I think that can only be because, um, uh, because people are individually making the choice to limit their movements uh, probably on top of that is the protective measures that people take uh, when they do go out. Um, so, for instance, uh, the decision to wear a face mask, which I think is a very good one. This is a really interesting question. It goes back to a comment that I made at the outset about transmission rates. Um, so there's, there's the observation that the transmission of COVID comes via droplets. Uh, or aerosol transmission. Do we know more about that? Do we have any idea about the extent to which uh, one transmission vector is different from the other? So um, I think, so the question is about droplets versus aerosols. Uh, I think that we're likely to get much more of that information as we develop better observations and studies of what's going on in the healthcare setting. Currently, I don't think that we can be confident in saying how much of it is one versus the other. Uh, and, um, and we should keep that in mind. On the other hand, the kinds of models that we're developing right now just treat transmission as uh, a general flow. And so all of the different sources of transmission, so for instance, contaminated surfaces, exposure to droplets, exposure to um, aerosols and so forth, are lumped together and measured by estimating the transmissibility coefficient uh, based on data that we have. Um, that's different than trying to measure each of those individually and add them all up. Uh, of course, different interventions target different routes of transmission, and that's why it'll be important to measure the effectiveness of different uh, uh, intervention strategies. As we're flattening the curve uh, with the initial onset of the virus, do we have any idea what the, the rate of transmission or the virulence will be when COVID, when there's another phase of COVID, say in the fall? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so in answering it, uh, I wanna do a couple of things. The first is that I wanna separate uh, the rate of transmission or transmissibility or contagiousness from virulence, which is the extent of severe disease or death. Uh, and the reason to separate those two in our minds is that uh, transmissibility is actually super dependent on human behavior. That's something that responds very quickly to 
um, to whatever it is that we're doing to our interactions with each other, um, the, uh, the uh, diligence with which we wash our hands, the extent to which we choose to stay home, the kinds of contacts that we have with people. Uh, the virulence, on the other hand, tends to be uh, more or less determined by two things. One is the nature of the virus itself, uh, and then the other is um, the demography of the population. For instance, uh, whether it's a young population or an elderly population, uh, whether it's a, a population with a high degree of, um, uh, of other risk factors uh, and health problems or not. Uh, I think that we are learning a lot about the potential for transmission and also the, um, uh, the virulence from this first wave. I think whether we see more transmission or less transmission in a future second wave depends on whether we learn our lessons from, uh, from this first wave about the best way to intervene and to stop transmission um, uh, sort of within the population uh, at large. So questions are beginning to wind down a, a bit here. Um, I want to remind everyone uh, that today's presentation is part of the Ask Me Anything series. Uh, please check out future sessions that are coming up with other uh, researchers and faculty at the University of Georgia. Uh, and you can check in on these at alumni dot uga dot edu. Um, again, my name is John Gittleman, Dean of the Odom School of Ecology. It's been an honor uh, to have you all. The questions have been fantastic. I want to thank Dr. Drake again. Uh, maybe one last question that I have. Um, is there a question, Dr. Drake, that you have? Uh, is there something in particular as you've been studying these models that you're really curious about, hope to get at fairly soon, uh, that you think would help us understand what COVID's about? Yeah, so um, I have so many questions about COVID-19. Uh, I think the one that most interests me right now is um, I believe that there are different strategies that we can have to, uh, to containing COVID. And when I read the, you know, the news, um, what I see is that one group is touting this idea, that we need to have a high level of testing. Another group is saying we need to have contact tracing. Uh, another group thinks it has to be social distancing. And of course, another group thinks it, that we, we can't tolerate more social distancing. I actually think that it's going to be a combination of all of these. And exactly which combination returns the greatest uh, value to us in preventing transmission, allowing us to contain the epidemic, um, at the, the lowest economic and social cost. Uh, figuring that out to me is the, um, uh, the golden question that, uh, that we're pursuing right now. Thank you so much. Thank you all for attending. We need your help. We need everyone to stick together as we're facing this uh, virus. We'll get there, we'll get over it. And um, thank you so much. <laughs>